Hey guys, welcome back to Fringe FM. Today we're talking robotics. Are they coming for your jobs? What's Bezos doing? What's up with Asimov's three laws of robotics? And where are we headed as a society? And this is Fringe FM. Let's get started. Hey guys, welcome back to Fringe FM. If this is your first time here with TED Talks, I'm your host, Matt Ward. I'm an angel investor, serial entrepreneur, and futurist focused on trying to build a bigger, better future for all of us. Today, we're talking about robotics. We're diving deep into the world of today, as it turns out. This is not a sci-fi thing. There are robots all around us, from Amazon's robots. I don't know if you've seen these videos, but you watch. And in the warehouses, Amazon is literally getting rid of all of their workers with robots working through the factory, moving around, shifting boxes, shifting pallets, shifting entire areas of their warehousing to get these products to you quicker. There's arms that are working in Mercedes. They're putting together cars. They're doing everything. And we're going to be diving into all of that. What is the state of the art when it comes to robotics? What does robotics even mean? How is the advancement in AI affecting robotics? All of these things and more we will be diving into now. If you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button here on YouTube. If you're tuning in on Facebook, then you're not going to have quite as much of the animations and video effects that we have going on. But if you go to fringe.fm slash YouTube, you can subscribe and make sure you don't miss a single one of these. You can also check us out on iTunes and Stitcher, Fringe FM. Just search for us there and we'll have links and everything, of course, in the show description. But today we're talking about robotics. So... A lot of us are interested in robotics, and there's plenty of good reasons why. The biggest reason being, of course, jobs. So you guessed it, the country, the world, they're, uh, we're a bit worried about jobs. So in today's episode, we're going to be discussing what's going to be happening with jobs as robotics and robots become more and more ubiquitous in society. And of course, this is our Q&A session of Fringe FM. So if you guys have questions, you have anything that you want to add, we have a nice little live viewer chat. You add your questions in there and we will answer those at the end of the episode. But today, AI has been advancing really, really quickly. And these advancements have been due primarily to the, the advances in the compute technology. So with GPUs, improving the ability to process larger amounts of data, and then some breakthroughs that we've had in AI and machine learning, deep learning, and image processing, primarily due to that com computational strength, the, the ability to put more and more and more calculations onto the cloud, AI is becoming really, really interesting. Now in robotics, this is, this is relatively easy. There's not that much that goes into it in terms of traditional IoT type devices. So in a factory, in a warehouse that's worked on moving around products, they're worked on putting together pieces, they're worked on lifting things that humans can't lift. We've all seen that. But we've also seen, for instance, the Boston Dynamics dog, which is a robot dog, which can walk around, it can be friends with you, it can do all kinds of incredible things. But this is a, this is a, dog and we're entering into this era where humans are starting to build robots. What happens in that era and how do we define responsibility? How do we keep control of what's happening and at the same time allow technology to advance? Because if we are living in a world where there are other types of beings, A, are those beings conscious? B, who's in charge of those beings? C, how does insurance and all the problems that come into responsibility play play into that. The, it's impossible to predict the, the implications or the actions of robots. So if you haven't checked out Fringe FM, I highly recommend looking at Professor Joanna Bryson's episode. If you go to fringe.fm and search for Bryson or Asimov, you'll find those there. But we talk about why Asimov's three laws of robotics, so to speak, are actually a very flawed approach to trying to have a, a system that society is able to use when it comes to governance laws for robots. As you have more citizens that are operating under different principles, how do you govern those citizens when they're not in fact conscious? That becomes really complicated. So there's a lot of implications in terms of robotics. The first and most obvious is going to be jobs and job displacement. What happens to society as our need and ability to create and to produce and to be able to earn an income starts to go down due to the fact that suddenly we have robots who are able to do everything faster, cheaper, better than you. Do you really want to have a job if your job is actually meaningless? If you can have a robot doing exactly what you're doing, well, then why do we have people in coal mines? Why do we have people working in factories? Why do we have all of these things that make absolutely no sense in a modern society where we just don't need that? And we are moving farther and farther towards that. That's why you see a lot of these tech companies now. The, the implications of exponential technology is as you have a trend going up and to the right, profitability becomes increasingly amplified because you need less and less human resources to do that. And robotics is going to play a really big role in that. Where 
where will the new jobs come from? There are some potentials, which we will talk about a little bit later in terms of potential new job creation, but do not pay attention to people that tell you everything is just like it's always been because it's not going to be. It's not going to stay there. And that's going to be something that if you if you believe that you will be falling for a, a hook, line and sinker, so to speak, the, the, the fake news aspect of that. So what's the point of manual labor? There is no point if we're able to replace manual labor with something that's more fulfilling for everyone involved and they're able to be more creative. You can get really, really interesting, but only if these people are able to be supported. For instance, if you take someone out of a mine and you give them an art brush, well, they might be able to make some incredible art, but are they going to be able to make money from that? So what happens with universal basic income? This has been something that's talked about a lot in Silicon Valley and tech circles in terms of as we automate away more and more jobs, and if we don't replace more jobs with the ones that we're destroying, what happens to these people? What happens to their livelihood? What happens to their definition of who they are as a person if suddenly they don't have a work? Well, I'm a lawyer. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a I'm a business guy. I'm a HR consultant. I'm whatever these things are. That's how people define themselves. What happens when your definition is taken away? That's something that's really interesting. Now we've seen this. We've seen this in the president that's been elected in terms of having a revolution because people want to go backwards in terms of technology, in terms of jobs, in terms of going back into coal mines. And this makes absolutely no sense. But people are afraid about a future where they don't see a future for themselves. And this is something that we all need to be discussing, the implications of robotics. If we get to a society where we do not need to work to create, we can have a great home, we can have a nice bed, probably like one of those Casper mattresses, don't worry, we're not advertising for those. We can have like a Tesla in the front yard. We can all have food that's healthy and all of this because it's done through robotics, it's done through a somewhat abundance type economy. What's the point of working? Well, if we're not working, we can be focused on things that are have higher higher impact. But if we don't, there's there's two there's two routes really. You go the route of some type of universal basic income or resource-based economy. Those are the most promising routes that I've seen in terms of trying to empower people either A through an income or B through access to resources like ride sharing, etc., where you don't actually need to own things. But if you don't go that route, you're bulletproofing your Teslas, you're building compounds, you're getting a billionaire's club in New Zealand where they're building bunkers, which is something that is happening. If all of these things are happening, how can we as a as a people just be able to avoid coming into a situation that's just not a good situation for us to be in. That's that's something I think we need to be talking about because there is a potential for a workers revolt. If you've ever seen in any time throughout history, the the more prevalent that we are in terms of larger income and uh, wealth disparity, the bigger problems that we have in terms of a society. Well, we're living in that world now and it's only getting more extreme. So what happens? Now, you might have noticed we've been doing some transitions with some of the video stuff. We'll, we'll work on this and get the kinks sorted out, but we've got some cool new software and we're trying to make these videos a bit higher quality. We'll be having nicer webcams on the future versions. The, unfortunately, Amazon's incredible logistics network did not get that to us quick enough, but we will have that. Thanks to Amazon's awesome robotics. It just turns out their payment processors suck. But let's see one, two other big implications I think about when I think about robotics. And one of them is this webcam. Who's watching me while I'm doing this? Well, I know that I'm on a live stream right now, and you guys know, and this is a mutual consent. But what about when I have an Amazon device, an Alexa, a Google Home in my home? Who's watching me? Who's recording me? When things are happening, do I want that getting leaked to the press? Do I want that getting leaked to other people, to the people involved? Do I want Amazon knowing that and trying to sell me some type of weird thing based off of what they know about me that they're not supposed to know about me because they're in my fucking home? That's a big question. How do we deal with this privacy in invasiveness that is becoming more and more prevalent with these voice and smart assistants? So these are, in essence, robotics. We have robots in our homes that are controlling what we do and are allowing us to have better functionality. Their trade-off is making sense for people, so people are making that trade-off. But yet, this is a slippery slope where more and more and more of your information becomes controlled, censored, etc. I mean... Look at Facebook, look at Google, look at what they're doing with your data in terms of selling you to advertisers. Is that something that you really want to have in your home? And Amazon, their only goal is to get you to buy more stuff that you don't need. So do you really want to give them that much more information? What about with all of these IoT and robot type devices in our homes? What about the cybersecurity and hacking threats of this? So, I mean, it's bad enough with phones, it's bad enough with laptops in terms of people getting hacked. Equifax gave up all of our information and they don't care. Uber gave up the ridiculous amount of driver and rider information and they only tell you about it like two years later well what happens when this is not just your device this is in your home this is videos of you naked in the shower or whatever you want to get into there's plenty of things you could get into here what about that 
How do we deal with that? How do we deal with the fact that everywhere we are, maybe there's a robot. Maybe there's like a little guy from iRobot, like with Will Smith walking around. He's recording everything that you're doing. A lot of the same issues with augmented reality will come in with robots. As we have more in society, well, they're going to have some type of camera in terms of being able to function in society. They're going to have some type of computer vision, but they're also going to be recording. They might be streaming. They're going to be doing a lot of different things, which are suddenly not human per se. They're capturing you. They're capturing your experience of the real world, but you're not giving any type of consent. No one's talking about any of this. What the hell? And then there's the obvious one. We've kind of talked about the driverless car scenario before. So you're driving along and do you want your driverless car to crash into a wall and kill you or kill those five little kids that are with their little old lady crossing the road? Well, society wants you to die and you want to not die. So that creates a problem. But what about in terms of just in general, when we have more robots in society and accidents happen, whether that is driverless cars, whether that is some type of humanoid or transport type robot moving things around, whether that's drones falling out of the sky and taking someone's head off, who's responsible? How do we think about that? Are we willing to give up technology, give up innovation, and give up the quality of life improvements for blips on the radar, so to speak, for accidental problems? I don't know. What do you think? I think we should be having these type of discussions, that's for sure. And I'm not seeing enough of this happening. And that's kind of the purpose of Tech Talks, is to talk about what I see happening, what I would like to see people talking more about, and then try to share my predictions and uh, the pros and cons of these type of tech so that we can at least think about it and you can either position yourself to be successful or get more going in terms of conversation. Just overall, try to build a better discussion around these type of topics. But now we're jumping into the pros. There's a ton of pros of robotics. Reduced pain, reduced manual labor and painful ridiculousness that's going on. Humanity has been, I mean, we kind of have two eras when it comes to humanity. We have the era of brute strength and we have the era of brute intelligence or brute creativity, we'll call it. We've transi or we're transitioning past the era of brute strength where the big tough guy isn't really that important anymore. Zuckerberg is like a total nerd and he's ridiculously wealthy and powerful. That wasn't something that perpetually or continuously was throughout history. Typically, it was the bigger, stronger guy. He was the one that was able to dominate the other ones. And because of that, well, we know how history turned out. But things have been changing. Things have been changing pretty quickly, really. And now we're living in an era where if you're smart, if you're intelligent, if you're creative, you can be really successful. Well, the people that don't have those attributes are, are a little bit in trouble, but the ones that do, it makes a better world. And if we're able to eliminate the need for those other jobs, there, there's a lot of pros, but there's some cons as well. But in terms of increasing the production capacity, if we were able to produce, let, we won't even go into the resource-based economy saying, let's say we have five cars, but your cars only use 5% of the time. So look, we can actually multiply that by like 20 and serve 100 people with five cars. But in terms of just the overall nature of being able to produce more at cheaper costs. Well, if we don't have human labor, if we don't have all these extra costs for manufacturing, you might not necessarily have a job, but you can afford a heck of a lot more if suddenly you're buying, I don't know, a Tesla for $5,000 instead of $50,000. Well, at scale, certain things start to work out, especially when we don't have people in the in the workforce that need money from, from these type of things. So we can get really interesting in terms of reduced cost, better access, better products, etc. With robotics, location matters less and less. So you can have factories located anywhere. Right now we have factories and most of our factories are located in China, India, Mexico, et cetera, up and coming, up and coming third world countries, places that really needed the economic boost and were willing to take the, the pollution hits and the, the labor, labor rights type hits. But in terms of in the future, there's no point. If you can have a factory anywhere and the only thing that comes into play is capital costs and robotics costs, well, those are going to be pretty much fixed across the world. So suddenly we can manufacture in the U.S. We don't have U.S. jobs in manufacturing, but we have a U.S. factory. So maybe that makes things a little bit better. It kind of changes, though. It changes the logistics of where things are located and where they're shipped. Obviously, this will be a slow transition because if you already have all your factories over in China, it's going to be a pain in the butt to switch them all over to somewhere else. And it really isn't going to make much sense. You're kind of just going to retrofit existing factories with more and more robotics, which we see especially in the auto industry. There's, I mean, you can you can find plenty of videos touring some of these factories. It's ridiculous. Elon wants to make his own little factory that's 100% automated, the, uh, the Giga factory. We'll see how that goes, and he's having his own problems, but at the same time, that is kind of the direction we're going. And moving this outside of cities, it makes things much better because A, you can have production closer, which means less shipping, less pollution, but B, it also means that people aren't living right in the pollution. We can kind of get this stuff out of our cities, have it local, and and yet still have what we want in terms of in terms of uh, reduced pol pollution where people are living, more space, etc. Robot factories are also incredibly good. So 
as humanity becomes interplanetary and then interstellar eventually, we're going to need to produce a lot in space. Right now it costs $1,000 per kilogram to ship something into space. That is a lot of freaking money. That's, that's you don't want to bring anything with you type of money. You go naked. Maybe you bring a pair of underwear kind of deal because it's so expensive. Well, manufacturing in space is going to be enormously important to humanity's long-term perspectives. That's both asteroid mining, so being able to take resources from existing celestial bodies and turn those resources, either via 3D printing or some type of robotic system, into usable goods. We need clothes. We need space stations. We need rockets. We need suits. We need all of this stuff, and we don't want to have to bring it with us. If you've ever gone on a road trip, you know it's so much easier to buy stuff there as long as where you're going doesn't have ridiculously high tourist prices. Well... That is the case here as well. If we're able to manufacture in space, we save significant amount of money. So that becomes really, really interesting as we expand into space. We, we did an episode actually on clean meat and clean meat production in space. This is the only way you're going to be able to eat fish, burgers, etc. in space. If you are interested in learning more about how people are lab growing meat, go to fringe.fm and check it out. It's really, really interesting. It's something I'm super passionate about. But that said, with robotics, there are some major cons as well. Now, before we, before we jump into those, if anyone has any questions, make sure to add those in the, in the YouTube question check section. We'll look at those, and at the end, I'll go through the chats, cover all of our questions, and try to make sure that everyone gets theirs answered. But now, jumping back to the, jumping back to the cons. So, there are some major drawbacks of robotics. We've talked about in terms of the jobs and poverty, what happens for people that don't have the skill set to be able to survive in this upcoming economy. There, there could be some major, major problems. Are governments going to float them? Are they going to live on the streets and die? I mean, look at San Francisco. San Francisco is super successful, and it's also super, super unequal. You have terrible homelessness. You have terrible poverty. You have terrible conditions for people, and then you have extreme wealth and success. Clearly, our system's not working for everyone. Are we able to fix that? And what about the lack of purpose? Suddenly, you don't have a job. What are you going to do tomorrow? Maybe you get some coffee, you drink the paper, you realize the paper is just there to make you sad about the world. Well, then what? Well, hopefully you get into something important, but that's not necessarily going to be the case because it's been ingrained into us. We have Western, Christian, Protestant almost values of work is important. Work is who you are. Work is why you're here. You're here to work and add value and yada, yada, yada. Well, as we take that away from people, I mean... People are going to be on the drugs, they're going to be jumping off buildings, they're not going to know what to do when suddenly they don't know who they are. And by taking away their purpose, their job, you're taking away their identity. That's big. What about insurance? Who's liable? So we have a driverless car crash into someone. Is it your fault for being in traffic? Is it the car's fault? I mean, the car's a robot, they didn't even design itself. Is it the programmer's fault? Are we going to find that guy? Because who's going to want to work at an AI driving company if suddenly he's on the hook for $100 million? Well, what about the company itself? Same deal. There's some pretty big problems there. Now they designed it, so there's pretty good there's pretty good reasons to say it's probably their fault. But what if what if it's something else? Maybe it, they drove into a, a regular car, and it's the other guy's fault. But how do you argue it's his fault and not the robot's fault? You get into a really complicated situation. So what happens with insurance? Who's liable? The the user, the manufacturer, the robots themselves? We obviously it shouldn't be the robots, but. Yeah, people like to pass the blame, so we'll see what happens there. But there can be some major problems with robotics. There can be some ridiculously great improvements in efficiency, etc., which are things I'm really excited about, and I think we all should be really excited about. But there are obvious, obvious hurdles. And what about autonomous drones? So specifically for military, we found if it kills, it uh, if it kills, then it gets some money. Well, drones are well, the consumer tech is so much farther ahead than the military tech, at least recently. The the military is definitely catching on to this and trying to become more and more active. We see a lot of tech companies now that are trying to distance themselves from the military because it's kind of it's kind of pretty dirty to have your technology and what you're building being used for kill people. But when it comes to robots, when it comes to drones, AI, these are going to be challenges. These are going to be questions that everybody has, and we have to figure out how exactly we deal with those. And right now, we don't have a really good answer. And I at least would hope that we start to talk a little bit more about these things that have kind of been taboo, because by being taboo, they're just kind of allowed to they're kind of allowed to be there, even though they, they probably shouldn't. So next, I want to talk about predictions. Everybody loves a good prediction. And what are we talking about? We're talking about the future of robotics. If you're just tuning in now, hit that subscribe button. On, if you're on YouTube, if you're on Facebook, you're not having the full experience. We're, we've been jumping between some different screens, adding a little bit of information and overlays. If you want to check that out, fringe.fm slash YouTube. You can find our YouTube channel there. You can subscribe. Make sure you don't miss out. 
Now, alternatively, if you're a podcast person, let me throw the information up right here. You can subscribe to the podcast. We're on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, you name it. If you're listening to this, fringe.fm slash whatever one of those names it is, you will find us there. If you just go and search in your typical podcasting platform, you'll find us there as well. And this is only our supplemental series. This is the live streams, Tech Talks. But if you're interested in these topics, I interview the world leaders when it comes to AI, space, genetics, quantum computing, human longevity, you name it. If it's a technology that rapidly accelerating and changing the way that humanity lives and functions in the future, that's the type of stuff we're talking about. So I definitely recommend going to fringe.fm and subscribing, checking us out on the podcast and listening to some of these ridiculously important and interesting people share their views on the future. And now I'm going to share mine. I'm nowhere near as exciting as they are, but let's jump into the predictions. Well, number one, duh, sex robots. Um, if we look at where money always goes, especially early on in the development of things, development of technologies from internet to payment processing, etc., the adult industry. We don't really need to talk about that that much, but there could be some really, really good pros from this. So there's plenty of, there's plenty of cons, the creepiness, the weirdness, but maybe, maybe we'll be able to reduce or eliminate some of the, some of the more negative things in our society. Porn, uh, anything to do with children and the adult industry, uh, rape, prostitution, etc. Because if you're able to have easy sex with a robot, maybe we can get rid of some biological needs and make people a little bit happier and a little bit less, uh, a little bit less gross. Um, what about new jobs all around? So in robotics, there's going to be a lot that's happening in terms of what we need, in terms of we need people to sell these things. We need people to uh, maintenance, etc. HVAC, these type of jobs where they might start to be automated a bit away. Well, dealing with these robotics and fixing them, the same thing with automotive, etc. People that have these type of skills of working with their hands, mechanical engineers, hands-on craftsmen, etc. There will be a ton of demand for them to service just in-home robots. We don't want to have to deal with this kind of stuff on our own because most of us have no idea how to do this. Well, that creates a ton of a ton of potential, including just the, the overall economic boost of having robots with manual labor and increasing automation. It'll be really interesting. Some jobs that obviously are going to get automated away, factory worker, truck driver, checkout clerk, that's already happening in plenty of different areas. The factories, we've seen those with the robot arms, truck drivers, these are talked about everywhere. The, the checkout clerks, Amazon Go is making, their, or Amazon's making retail stores that don't even have workers in them. And it's all becoming pretty seamless in terms of cutting out all of these jobs, which is great for the consumer because they don't want to have to deal with interacting with others, going through difficult processes, waiting in checkout lines, oh, excuse me, etc. But at the same time, it, I mean, what happens to people when suddenly they don't have the support? Uh, so there's some questions. Now, in terms of where it's happening first, it's happening much more right now in the software field. So it's much more easy to, to automate software than it is to create specific custom hardware. For instance, we see robot arms that are working in factories, doing quite a bit of things. KUKA is uh, one of the larger manufacturers of these. I actually looked at interning them when I was in college. I'm glad I got into the fields I did instead. But it's a, it's a really interesting space. But being able to create hardware is really complicated. It's much easier to create software and automate away jobs through that. Now, the, the interesting, really interesting part is when you merge the, the hardware and the software capabilities, which is what we're seeing with a lot of the advancements in robotics. And that's where we'll see uh, some major, major growth in the future. One sec, coffee break. Oh, maybe I can get a robot to talk for me. It would make things much easier. I don't, I don't know if they'd be creative and have as, as many terrible tangents as I do. So, predictions. People are going to start to wonder, are robots conscious? Have you watched Westworld? If you haven't, it's a show where humans essentially have built a trailer, uh, not a trailer park, a theme park, where there's robots everywhere, and you can go and visit, and there's robots living in this old western type world and you could pretty much do whatever the hell you want with them and people do people become in essence monsters they rape they murder they rob they do everything all of these negative impulses that we seem to have or at least people like to think that we have as humans people act these out on robots and it's totally fine right because they're just robots but there's two problems a that creates a society where people are more are more sadistic. I mean, if they're willing to take out these actions, that's a little bit weird. Now, if it's in a video game, it's something that's not human, it's not conscious in any way, it's not so bad as going out and torturing an animal or what have you. But when it comes to robots, people are really, really poor when it comes to understanding what it is they're dealing with. So for instance, yes, remember to subscribe. So for instance, if I'm talking to a robot or I'm talking to a person, the... Um, you're not able to tell that I'm conscious. I might seem like a human being. I might sound like a human being. I might seem conscious, intelligent, sentient, etc. But there's no way for you to actually know. And that's kind of the paradox of science, religion, spiritualism, etc. 
you can't actually know. Now with a robot, you can't actually know either. If we're able to create robotic or robot experiences that very least seem to mimic what it means to be human, then we're going to start to assume that these are conscious, they're sentient in some ways, because that is the only thing that we're used to. We're used to animals that move around and have some type of consciousness, some type of sentience. We're used to humans that move around and we perceive or presume have some type of conscious or sentience. Well, with robots, as we start to assume that they have this, one of two things happens. Either we become more sadistic because we have robots who have become, in essence, our slaves. We've gone back in time uh, a few hundred years and suddenly they're doing everything that we need and living horrible lives where they earn no money. Or we say, okay, maybe they're conscious. Maybe we need to treat them like people and give them the right to vote and all of this, in which case our entire economy may collapse because I mean, freeing slaves, if you were to do that instantaneously in a slave-driven culture, the economy would collapse pretty much overnight. And this would be very similar. What happens there? And that's, uh, that's an interesting, interesting dilemma for, for people to think about. Again, if you have any questions, make sure you add those in the, in the comments section of the YouTube, fringe.fm slash YouTube. You can find our live streams there. We go live every Wednesday and Sunday at 12.30 p.m. EST and add any questions that you have there. But now we're jumping back into the ethics of what it means to be human. Well, we talked about what it means to become a terrible human, but what does it mean to be human when suddenly we're living in a world where we and those around us are becoming enhanced through robotics, either from alternate creatures that appear to be human or from quite literally adding on robotic arms, etc. We, we have a cyborg or a transhuman type movement happening where people want to become more than human. And I'll admit, it's pretty sexy. Do you want to die when you're 80, 90, 100? Or do you want to live beyond this? Do you want to be able to have a bigger impact on the world? I know I'm driven by impact and I sure as hell don't want to die right now. I'm sure a lot of you guys don't as well. Well, what happens when certain humans start to become more robotic or cyborg, so to speak, is, uh, is, is food for thought. It's food for a debate that has not happened in terms of what it means to be human. Right now, we only have more or less our cultural norms, which are driven by our religious past. But in the future, hopefully this will be changed a little bit because, I mean, if you walk into the future looking backwards, you're probably going to find yourself bumping into a few things. And that seems to be what we're doing right now. What about isolationism? So right now we're living in a world where people have their smartphones, they have the internet, they can pretty much do what they want and isolate themselves. The one and only real need that they have is some type of human to human relationship. They want to be with people because we evolved to be around a group, a tribe. We evolved to have others around us who can make us happy, make us sad, make us laugh, make love, make all of these things, which we will no longer have Possibly, if we're living with robots who are able to simulate some of this for us, we're able to have our friend, and he's our best friend, and he's over there, and he's massaging my feet, and he's making food for me, and he's laughing at my jokes, and the perfect friend, right? But that's also pretty isolating if you're living with a robot. What, what exactly does that mean? Is that what you want? Is that what some people are going to want? I know people now, uh, there, there's a crisis in Japan happening of typically... Um, younger, middle-aged, millennial male uh, men, and they're dating AI apps. They're dating robots. Essentially, it's, a, it's, a, it's an application where you can, you can message in a, in a chatbot type format and the, they'll make jokes and you can talk to each other and pretend like it's your girlfriend and it's just a piece of software. And that's already happening. And there's nothing physical happening. And there's no VR experience where it looks like something's happening. It's just an iPhone app. Well, when we have suddenly have something that you can touch and feel and taste and smell and all of that, whew, that's something. That's something. I'm not sure what's happening there, but I, I think it's going to be interesting. And the, the last and most obvious prediction I have right now is that uh, we will be having larger and larger amounts of deliveries happening specifically via robots, whether that's drones, whether that's we have our own robot butlers, etc. Right now, we have a lot of delivery people that are bringing things around the country, or we have people that are going to stores to get things. Well, both of those are, both of those are a little bit silly in, in a situation where you're able to manufacture products, you're able to manufacture robots. Uh, hardware that's able to bring those things for you. So obviously, this is gonna this is gonna proliferate. Amazon's been scaling up in terms of what they want to do with drones. They have the perfect logistics network right now. If you're interested, actually, in looking at Amazon and what they're doing, go to um, 
Just search for Gods of the Valley. You can find a book that I've written on the four main tech giants, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. Or if you just Google Amazon Gods of the Valley, you should be able to find the Medium post. It's on there. Uh, medium.com slash at it's Matt Ward. It's the same as my Twitter handle. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find out everything I'm tweeting about and dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But check that out if you want to see where Amazon's headed in drone delivery and becoming the overall e-commerce and um, overall commerce player in the, in the entire U.S. is really where we're headed. But now it's time for us to jump into the question answer session. Let's see if we've had anything going on in the chat room currently. Give me a couple of seconds to check this out. So we're still pretty early on when it comes to our, when it comes to the the live streams. We're still getting going and we're still letting people know about us. It looks like we don't have anything happening right now. So that is all that I have for you guys right now. If anyone has any questions when it comes to robotics or where we're headed, what's going to be like, and what's going to like, what's life going to be like in a in a world of ubiquitous robots where we suddenly have our wants and needs and desires met by little mechanical creatures doing our bidding, then by all means, add your questions now. And if you don't have anything else, I am going to start to close things up. Anybody got anything? Anything interesting happening? It doesn't appear to. Then I want to thank you guys for tuning in. I'm your host, Matt Ward. This camera thing is really interesting, and we're dealing with trying to make better, more awesome futures for everybody. You should subscribe to the podcast. If you go to fringe.fm slash iTunes slash Stitcher slash Android or slash Spotify, you can find us there. Subscribe on your favorite player. And remember, subscribe here on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. And until next time, I am Matt Ward signing off. You have an incredible day, and make sure you kick some butt, stay classy, and get to work. I will talk to you folks again soon. And until next time, cheers.